why would she not like your position? Yeah, she did not. Uh, she did not like <laughs> the position that I was taking. And I'm pretty sure that's 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 a difference too. Really interesting modern yeah. examples. This is really the big battleground from the perspective of critical scholarship. This is literally within like a generation. This is just in our conversations. There's just no question about it. If I remember correctly, the Aramaic stuff is not written in the first person. Christians will read this at face value and go, yeah, Daniel lived in Babylon. How'd you get it? The book of Daniel is used by several evangelicals today as a way of proving prophecies true. We even have some people a little bit different, very strange ways of trying to push this book off. Like it has no context to 6th century, 2nd century BCE, you name it. It's just purely futuristic, mm. which sounds silly. I mean, the way Jews handled it, none of them ever handled it that way. Uh, they all tried to think it had to do with them or their time and stuff. So, tell us about Daniel, Dr. Joshua Bowen. And Kip Davis, Dead Sea Scroll scholar, a seriologist, you've written several books, The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament that goes into a lot of this stuff. And you were actually one of the first people who said, you need to get with John J. Collins, who's mm. the man when it comes to Daniel. And I did. And when I did, you were like, well, I didn't know that was going to happen. And then, um, How'd you get him? <laughs> you have a course uh, that, well, you have a couple courses that we're putting out here on MVP courses. And Kip, you have a course too, huge yeah. course. You can count that as multiple courses. And the last one. lecture is most, like half of it's about Daniel. So. Right. Apocalypticism. Yeah. And uh, you Zombies. use yeah. the Walking Dead and other yeah. things that are really interesting, modern Very examples. Very silly. Tell us about Daniel um, from a critical scholarly standpoint and what it's about. Who, when is it talking yeah. about? When was it written? Let's get into some of the textual stuff. So, I think, I think when we start, I just have to say that um, before I started making uh, content on YouTube, I think some of the first stuff I saw from Josh was his responses about the book of Daniel. I, I'm pretty sure you did at least one or maybe a couple to uh, S.J. Thomason. Yeah. Who was, <laughs> who was like going crazy at the time about uh, Daniel. And it's, uh, yeah, but yeah, it just, uh, so that was, I don't know. That's where I think, I think that's one of, one of the first places I got. Uh, yeah, she got did to not, uh, she did not like <laughs> the position that I was taking. I've had some interesting arguments. Yeah. Uh, Why would she not like your position? Well, that is an excellent segue, Derek. Very good. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, sort of broadly here, uh, the issue that um, I think evangelical or fundamentalist um, fundamentalist face, whether they be um, you know scholars or lay people is uh, this interpretive framework that is driven by the inspiration and inerrancy of the text. And if you hold to that, uh, in a, at least in a particular way, uh, when you come to the book of Daniel, the way that it presents itself is it's, you know, written by this, uh, you know, essentially six, written in the sixth century uh, by a guy named Daniel, and he's reporting on events that he lived through. Right. And uh, this is so critical uh, for this interpretive approach because one of the things that you see in Daniel, particularly in the you know, chapters two and seven and eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, is uh, this, these visions, these dreams, or whatever that um, describe things that are going to happen in the, at times, very distant future for him uh, centuries later. And this this type of predictive prophecy is incredibly important uh, as an evidence for the authenticity of uh, you know the the inspiration the divine inspiration of that text and of course you know starting you know way way back um, so you know when we think about critics of the book of Daniel that go back all the way to you know people like Porphyry uh, you know. Very early on, it was recognized that, wait a second, um, the way that the book of Daniel is structured, the things that Daniel gets wrong, the things that Daniel gets right, 
uh, and the way that those things sort of, you know, uh, play out in the book, you know, led scholars all the way back to Porphyry to say this, this is prophecy ex eventu, right? It's prophecy after the fact. Uh, and, but, but this, this is really the big battleground because evangelical fundamentalist scholars, or, you know, uh, need this to be predictive prophecy. Uh, whereas again, the consensus view, even among most evangelicals that, that I run into at least would say, yeah, this, this is, uh, second century, but that doesn't negate its, you know, value to us as, play. but that's where the, the fight is. And maybe I think, I think it's really important to spend some time talking about the structure of this book too, right? Because on several levels, uh, scholars for a long time have recognized that uh, this is not just Daniel sitting down and, and recording what's going on from chapter one all the way through to the end of chapter 12. But what is actually taking place at a minimum is the combination of a couple, at least a couple uh, different types of texts. And like one of the dead giveaways in this is the language. Yeah. So Daniel starts in Hebrew and the entirety of chapter one where, where it introduces uh, Daniel and, and he's, part of the, he's part of the second exile to Babylon. And he's living, you know, in, in the court of, uh, of the king Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and, and this first chapter establishes him as, as a, 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 a prototypical ideal Jew is one of the overarching themes of this of this book so this is all in hebrew in chapter one and then chapter two starts and nebuchadnezzar has a dream and he's very upset by his dream and he can't remember his dream uh so then he invites his uh magicians and his his uh uh and dream interpreters and his and his his religious entourage to him uh, not just to interpret the dream, but to tell him what it is. But it says, you know, he, he tells them, you need to, you need to tell me what's going on here. And then it says in the text, and they responded to him in Aramaic. And then at that point in the text, the language switches and they, they respond to him in Aramaic. Now, this is something that takes place in other texts in the Hebrew Bible. Like in the book of Isaiah, there's, there's a, a place where um, courtiers from Egypt or from Babylon come into Israel and it said, and you know, there it's like, and they said to them in Aramaic and the quotation is in Aramaic. But then in the book of Daniel, you know, they respond to him in Aramaic, but then the text just yeah. keeps going in Aramaic. in Aramaic. And then all the way through chapter three, four, five, six, seven, hmm. it's like, this block of Aramaic text. And then in chapter eight, it's Hebrew again. Yeah. And eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. These are all Hebrew oracles. So like scholars look at this and go, well, you've got two different literary traditions and you can, and you can divide it. It's not just the language either. They're just, they're just completely different types of literature. Those, that whole Aramaic section are the stories of Daniel and his religious piety of being a prototypical ideal Jew living in the diaspora. This is the, the overarching theme of, of all of these court tales, tales about Daniel living in the Babylonian court. When you get to the Hebrew stuff, suddenly it's visions, yeah. visions of the end times, visions of the last days, visions of things that are to come in precise exacting detail, hmm. right? So scholars have looked at this and gone, you know, the response has been, well, we've got this, this core of material that's Aramaic, this Aramaic literature that has obviously been appended with these, these Hebrew texts featuring the same character, probably known from 
you know, they, they knew this Aramaic literature and these stories of, of Daniel living in Babylon. So they constructed these visions and set them, you know, in the first person. And I'm pretty sure that's, 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 that's a difference too. If I remember correctly, the Aramaic stuff is not written in the first person. Christians will read this at face value and go, yeah, Daniel lived in Babylon. But as I've interviewed John Collins before, and I mentioned Daniel was this figure, almost a mythic legendary figure from the Babylonian mythologies Mm -hmm. that there's, there's this, I think it's from Babylonian mythology, but that Daniel was this like mythic figure in their, in their stories or in their literature. Do you think that's where they're picking up, creating the narrative of a Daniel figure from? So you have a Daniel in Ugaritic texts. Mm-hmm. Ugaritic, okay. Um, and I, it's been several years since I've looked back at the at the data, so I don't remember um, what most scholars say about the connections between them. But I uh, like you do this seem figure to figure is have, also known in in the book of Job. I think it's Job and in, in Ezekiel. Too. You you sort of have these ideas of um, uh, as as you're pointing out, like these uh, more archetypal, yeah. sort of pristine um, people that are uh, a, characters able to be drawn upon mm-hmm. uh, in that sense. But I mean, I do want to point out that from a Christian perspective, uh, and this is something that I think we all really need to wrestle with, is that these sections are written in Aramaic and, you know, Jesus probably spoke Aramaic and, you know, parts of Daniel are about Jesus. So, I mean, like coincidence. So, we have this weird (laughs) Aramaic Hebrew combination in this book, uh, visions, and then you got stories. Some scholars think even some of the stories might... So, while we think this is put together in the second century BCE, yeah. a, a, roughly a decade before in, like any final predictive when things will actually end kind of stuff, um, some of these stories may have stemmed back an oral tradition, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, like different things like that may have come back from. Yeah. Daniel, uh, something else we need to say here too is that there's so much more. Um, than just what's in our in our Bible about Daniel. We've got the, the Septuagint, the Greek translation, which preserves additional material. You've got a story of uh, a story called Susanna, which is a really really great story actually, featuring Daniel as a as a young man, and and it's in your in the in the Septuagint. It's it's kind of Susanna is is set right at the very beginning. It's right before the Book of Daniel proper, almost as like a. a um, almost like a prequel, like a, like an mm. introduction to this, this young man, Daniel, who, you know, solves this great, this, this, this great, uh, this great, it's like a great legal caper. Um, he, he solves this, this, this mystery of, of this, it's like a, like an ancient crime drama where, where he solves this case of, uh, yeah, these, these, these men are wanting to, wanting to have sex with this, this, this woman, these Jewish men, and they, they devise a plan to, to you know, I, I'm not going to go into it, but it, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great story. And, and it's kind of set at the beginning. And then there's right in the middle of Daniel, there's a whole big chunk called the prayer of uh, the three young men, uh, which is, which is a, a, a prayer text that's set in the mouth of, of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, while they're in the the fiery furnace in in chapter four, and then there's there's stuff at the end. There's 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 Bell and the Dragon, which is uh, a story of uh, it, it's it's two stories basically. It's a story of um, the 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 temple of the god Bell, and um, and then there's another story of a of a dragon that lived outside of of Babylon, and Daniel plays an integral role in 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 basically. He's he's like the 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 Jewish hero in these stories, showing how you know how silly those those Babylonians are, kind of thing, right? Hmm. So there's all this other uh, material featuring this figure, this this Daniel figure. Um, one of the exciting things about the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls is that there's all sorts of additional material featuring Daniel. And the really exciting thing about this stuff is almost all of it's written in Aramaic. 
And so you have, you know, these, these texts, a couple of these texts are called pseudo Daniel because they, you can see Daniel's featured by name, but then it's another kind of one of these kind of court stories. It's too fragmentary to know what's going on, but you can recognize that, that it features Daniel, you know, in the Babylonian court, very similar to the uh, stories that appear in our biblical text. There's another story, uh, called, uh, um, the, uh, I think it's just called the four trees. And it, it, again, it features Daniel and he's, you know, it, it has something to do with, with a, a prophecy of trees relative to kind of in the similar vein as the visions that appear in the Hebrew portion towards the end, but again, written in Aramaic, maybe the most famous of these texts is something called the prayer of Nabonidus. Uh, and this is a really, really exciting text because it's again, written in Aramaic. It's written in the first person by purportedly by Nabonidus, who was, uh, the last king of Babylon. So he's, he, he rules after Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. He's not a popular king in Babylon. But you've got this, this very interesting text written in the first person in the mouth of Nebuchadnezzar where he talks about becoming ill, becoming very sick, um, and nobody's able to help him. And then this unnamed, anonymous, uh, Jewish, uh, wise man comes and looks after him and, and prays for him and heals him. And it's a miracle. And the text of this prayer of Nabonidus, when you set it alongside uh, the story of Nebuchadnezzar's madness yep. in, in Daniel chapter four, you can see a very clear yeah. textual parallel, which has convinced scholars that the prayer of Nabonidus is actually like an old independent form of this story that ended up getting incorporated into the book of Daniel. The anonymous Jew is then given a name. The uh, main figure is changed from Nabonidus to Nebuchadnezzar. Hmm. And the story is developed slightly from this sickness to uh, Nebuchadnezzar's madness. But it's a fast. What, what the Dead Sea Scrolls has have really, really helped us to do is to explore on a fascinating level the very clear development that's taking place within the book of Daniel and the existence then of this whole wide range of literature, all these, like who knows how many types of stories were being circulated, um, you know, during the Persian or at least the Hellenistic period featuring this, this figure named Daniel. So, so it's pretty clear from this that Nabonidus was historically actually sick and Nebuchadnezzar went insane. They're both, <laughs> yes, they're both historically well, accurate. Clearly. We do know that Nabonidus was actually, uh, he did suffer from a, um, an illness. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah. This is, this is, this is historically legitimate. Like mm -hmm. he, he was legitimately. He, he left. Well, I guess maybe we don't know for sure, but one of the, one of the thoughts is that Nabonidus famously abandoned the city of Babylon and went to live, uh, out in this, in this other town, uh, while he was the king. And one of the thoughts that the re, one of the thoughts are the reason he left is because he was Ew. going to, to try and treat himself of, from, some sort of debilitating sickness. So, yeah, I mean, like what, you know, from the, from the documentation that we have, um, like Paul Alain Beaulieu wrote, uh, like published uh, an entire study on looking at uh, the documentation that we have from the period of Nabonidus. And um, it's probably a little dry for the average reader, but uh, I, I talk about it in volume one of the Atheist Handbook. Uh, but essentially, like what we know is uh, Nabonidus, as, as Kip has pointed out, was not a terribly popular figure. 
among the like the priesthood of Marduk because what he did early on and it started it developed throughout his reign um he started to pull away a little bit from the worship of Marduk and move more toward the worship of Sin the moon god and that developed as time went by and became like more uh substantial to the point that when he left he left his essentially left his post uh and went to the oasis of Tama and left his son um, who shows up in the biblical text mm-hmm. is Belshazzar, Belshazzar. Uh, as like a like an under he's he's not he's not quite the, the role of king yeah right there there are certain things that uh, that remain uh, the responsibility and the prerogative of Nabonidus even though he's actually outside of the land but one of the things the king was required uh, to do or or at least as far as the tradition was concerned was each year uh, he would. Um, take part in the uh, Akitu festival, which utilized the text, the Enuma Elish, uh, which is, you know, the ascendancy of Marduk. And if the king was not there, they could not celebrate the Akitu festival and they couldn't like, you know, do that and that, that, that whole ritual. And it was, it was a huge problem <laughs> anyway. Um, but part of the part of the thing that we need to recognize, I think, about the book of Daniel from the, the, the aspect of this debate about is it written in the sixth century, is it written in the yeah. second century, is the uh, like the historical analysis of the of, of, of the data points that we see presented in the text. And, you know, as Kip was just pointing out, this confusion of Nebuchadnezzar and Nabonidus, um, like we know that Nabonidus was Belshazzar's father not Nebuchadnezzar. And so, if you listen to Christian apologists, what they'll say is, well, 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 maybe, you know, Av, you know, or Semitic, the word for for father in Semitic doesn't necessarily mean father. It could also mean grandfather, even great-grandfather. And, and Daniel, is it five or six? Uh, uh, end of five. Yeah. End of five. Yeah. Belshazzar is explicitly identified as the son of Nebuchadnezzar. And they, they make this argument, well, you know, maybe it means like grandson, right? Because that's possible in Semitic. But the problem is that maybe Maybe he married a daughter right? of, of Nebuchadnezzar. Because that that's the, that would, yeah, that that's would the next right? thing, right? Well, it's like, okay, fine. Let's say it's grandson. He's not his grandson either, right? <laughs> like, and so then it's like, well... You know, maybe uh, so. Nera Glisser was, uh, you know, one of the kings in the New Babylonian Empire, and he married one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters. So maybe Nabonidus married one. It's like, okay, well, I mean, like, how far do you want to go with this? And so, is it possible? Sure, but the problem is when you have texts that are explicit uh, that have these things attributed to Nabonidus elsewhere. It's like, oh, okay, so there's confusion, right? Or intentional or unintentional, um, you know, changing of the names. And when you see this sort of thing, even with the figure Darius the Mede, it does the same thing. Yeah, and when Darius, uh, you know, you have Darius the First, and Darius the First has certain things that he did, you know, uh, setting like reorganizations into satrapies. Like these are things that are attributed to this Darius the Mede. That, you know, scholars are pretty, pretty emphatic. Now, it looks like it's a confusion with Darius the first, who is not, there is no Darius the Mede that we know of. Um, and so at any rate, the point is that, um, when you, when you come to the text and you look at the historical data that are presented there, you see a pattern. And the pattern is that Things that are described that would have happened back during the actual life of Daniel, they're very vague, right? And or he, wrong. Or, and, and he gets some of them wrong, right? Which is, it's bizarre, some of the yeah. things that he gets wrong. But, you know, if that's all we had, uh, maybe. But the problem is that when you get specifically down into chapters 10 and 11, um, now you have the prophecy section where it's talking about historical data points that are incredibly specific. You know, just read through uh, chapter 11 and you'll see like, you know, this specific king goes to the north, makes this alliance, and then the daughter, you know, and they, they come with the uncle. And it's like, <laughs> oh my God, like this is crazy. It's not just like this kingdom will reign. Yeah. Right. And, um, and he gets 
all of them right up to verse like 35. And at verse 35, it makes what scholars have determined are genuine predictions that are wrong, right? Mm -hmm. They don't come to pass. And so anyway, the the point is this, um, that uh, when you have early on during the life of the supposed prophet, they're general, get things wrong, but then in the future, very, very specific, gets them all right up to a very certain point. That's what leads scholars to say, mm, we need to revisit this and see maybe he's writing during this latter period. Yeah. We've got we've got we've got the issues of history. Um, we've got these 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 two different types of literature. Now we've got this expansive collection of literature that's all appears to be Aramaic. There's all this data that accumulates to 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 I think demonstrate without a shadow of a doubt what you're dealing with here when it comes to the book of Daniel. And yet time and again, uh, the response from Christian apologists especially is that no, 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 no. This is all stuff that, that traces all the way back to the sixth century. And it's super important for them because uh, these latter, uh, what scholars will call the ex eventu prophecies. These are prophecies written after the fact that appear in the last chapters of Daniel are far and away. These would be like smoking gun, yeah. best examples of fulfilled prophecies yeah. that are contained in the whole Bible. This is why. These are so important to uh, fundamentalists and to evangelicals. Yep. And now I, I think it's it's something something that that we will often hear then uh, in response from um, uh, the evangelical side of this argument is I mean I talked a little bit about about some of the different types of Daniel literature in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Very importantly. There were also six fragments from six copies of the book of Daniel that were discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, evangelicals are very keen to point to this stuff Hmm. and say, you know, it dates the earliest copy dates to uh, they'll like to say to like 120, 130 BCE. Which would be um, late second century from a critical, from the perspective of critical scholarship, this is literally within like a generation of when these texts would have been written, right? It's very, very close. Um, a, 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 a common talking point among uh, Christians are, this is just too close. Yeah. You, you can't, they would never have accepted this as scripture if, you know, it was, you know, it, if it, if it wasn't already very, very ancient. So it has all like these manuscripts actually show us that here's a, here's a community, a Jewish community that believes that Daniel is scripture and they could have only done so. If it's already hundreds of years old, they never would have adopted this, you know, this, this late literature. Um, so this is, this is, is, uh, I would say problematic, um, from this perspective on the one hand, I think it's exciting as a scholar on the other hand, just because of what the actual Daniel manuscripts show us about the book of Daniel at Qumran. For one thing, uh, I I mentioned we have six copies. I believe it's only two of those appear to be like the whole thing. Daniel chapter one through through chapter 12. And these are not the early texts. These are, these are all from like the first century. So the time of Jesus. Now you're dealing with, with stuff that's um, like 150 200 years uh after the you know the composition of the uh of the hebrew portions of daniel uh at the end 
Um, so very interestingly, the early manuscripts uh, only preserve certain parts of the book of Daniel. And the earliest one that we have, 4Q Daniel, uh, is, I think it's 4Q Daniel C or D. I think it's C. But okay. Yeah. So it's it's uh, this is a this is a very interesting manuscript because we have text there that survives from chapters eleven and twelve, um, but when scholars and it's 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 basically it's like two or three single fragments. When scholars are able to reconstruct what's there, we can see how big, like how many lines there would have been in a column in this manuscript, and based on that, we can tell. This is a very small manuscript. It's too small to have contained the entire book of Daniel. Hmm. It looks like it's about the right size to have contained all of chapter 11 and all of chapter 12. So, as a scholar, what that tells me is this is, some, this is a manuscript um, that predates even the combination of these texts all put together as like a single book of Daniel. So again, we have evidence from the manuscripts themselves which show us this developmental picture. And then I'll just mention one more. Um, another one of the very early manuscripts is just a single, no, it's it's like two or three tiny little fragments that survive from uh, the first part of Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 is, is the famous mm. uh, passage where Daniel uh, is reading Jeremiah's prophecy, and then he 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 sees uh, Jeremiah's prophecy of the seventy years, and he gets upset because he doesn't understand what's going on. Because you know, why are we still in in captivity? Why is this still happening to us? And then he there's this long penitential prayer that he delivers uh, to God, and at the end of the prayer, Gabriel the angel appears to him and gives him the right interpretation. Right. So we have a a. a a, a couple of these little fragments which preserve parts of this penitential prayer. Um, but interestingly, what is this? Is this a copy of the book of Daniel? Or is this just a copy of this penitential prayer that was a standalone composition, a proper prayer that people would recite that then ended up getting folded into the book of Daniel. Um, so, I mean, we don't know, but what we, what we can be certain of is that these fragments on their own, as they have survived, they don't, they, they don't readily lend themselves to having been associated with Daniel in any way. He's not mentioned in them. Uh, and and there's no indication that they would have been part of this larger work. Yeah, and I think to sort of to sort of tie this up, maybe from a you know looking at this and, and dealing with this apologetic argument. And this is what I like to go to. Apologists will often want to go directly to Daniel nine twenty four mm -hmm. to twenty seven. Mm -hmm. They want to say, okay, look, seventy weeks, right? This is. From, you know, the destruction or the rebuilding of the temple down to when Jesus rides in on the donkey, right? To the day, who was it that put that? Is it Harold Honer that, or is it Sir Robert Anderson? I can't remember who, <laughs> the coming prince. Yeah, I can't remember, but um, they, they've been calculated down oh, to the yeah, very right. day. Lots and lots and lots Jesus. of problems with that. But <laughs> um, the thing that I do is I, I tend to just shy away from Daniel 9, 24 to 27, not because I don't think there are good answers for it, but because I think those answers are a little complicated. Mm -hmm. But the easiest thing to do if you're engaging with, with a Christian apologist who's trying to say that Daniel's predicting Jesus is just go to chapter 8, go to chapter, uh, chapter 9, 10 to 12, even chapter 7 and say, who is the final kingdom, yeah. right? What's the final kingdom? Because in 8 and 10 through 12, it is explicit, it's Greece. I think even in one of them, it's, it explicitly yeah. says the final kingdom it is Greece. Greece. Yep. <laughs> and when you, when you make linguistic connections and lexical connections between these, uh, these four visions or passages, um, you see things like uh, 
the uh, th- this figure that's supposed to come at the end, the one that abomination of desolation and and that type of language. There's consistency among the four where you can determine that this final person, this figure that's supposed to come is Antiochus, the fourth epiphanies, period. Mm-hmm. There's just no question about it. And th- th- so the reason that that's so significant, if Greece is the end before the final kingdom of God comes, real problem for it being Jesus, because we know that the kingdom of God didn't come after Greece. Well, this is this is why in um, what in uh, in, in second Estros, uh, I don't remember where chapter 10, maybe somewhere around there. Um, it, it, it talks about the book of Daniel and it says, d- essentially paraphrasing, like Daniel thought that it was Greece, but God didn't reveal everything to yeah. him. So now I'm going to reveal to yeah, you. Yeah. I had to guess, guess who it actually is. It's actually Rome. Right. Yeah. And, but there's a reason that that had to be written. And it's because clearly Daniel's writing about Greece. So it like this is a it's a showstopper. The apologist, I've, I've never met an apologist that had a reasonable response to that. What they always have to do is go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But look at Daniel 9, 24 yeah. to 27. And even there, like y- you can just say to them, look at the language. What's the abomination of desolation? Look in the other chapters. Look in the other visions. What is that? Right? Who is the you know this this final figure? And it's Antiochus the fourth. So it has to be. Yeah, yeah. that's why <clears throat> that person that keeps coming up with other names on YouTube right now, who is an apologist, who's you know a lone wolf on this whole prophecy game, they they see these problems. They know they see what you're saying, right? So th- instead of going. Okay, yeah, it was Greece. No, no, no. If I do that, that's wrong. We know that. No, it's Rome. No, 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 no. It's not wrong because if I do that, we got a problem. Right. And they do the same thing with me in Revelation. I'm talking about mm-hmm. the the hill, the city on the seven hills, oh, and it's right, like yeah. ubiquitous at this time. That is Rome. It just doesn't say we're talking about Rome, right? Right. Um, you know, and and also, why are they speaking? You know, symbolically, when it comes to the beast, uh, this is Nero, and we know from the Sibylline oracles, Nero was also called the beast, and uh, there's some significance to this connection to what was going on. So, all of that, eh? Ignore the historical criteria that's near and contemporaneous to tell us what this is. No, no, no. What if all scholars are wrong? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All of you are wrong. I'm listening. <laughs> uh-huh. If all scholars are wrong and it's in our future. Yeah. And it's oh, like, wow. yeah, because that's the most probable and likely solution to this. It it, it, it really fixes this problem um, that, you know, everybody got it wrong. Because, well, why did Jews then start saying it wasn't Greece and it was Rome? Because they were wrong. And so this is what happens is you you, you want to recontextualize whatnot. An interesting point that you brought up about the whole fragment thing, right? Is yeah, yeah. I thought about what you said before you even got into Daniel found, we found, you know, nine and 10. We found this little prayer thing and none of it has Daniel's name in it. And this is the early stuff. Yeah, we yeah. don't know, but the late stuff has the whole collection. And we're talking about a century or two, century and a half later um, before you even see the whole book as, as yeah. a book of Daniel. Yeah. But I thought about this two things that I thought were relevant. And one of them is, Let's just pretend we did have them whole and it was 40 or 50 years later. That assumption they wouldn't take it serious. How do you know yeah, what they yeah. would have thought? So, I, you know, I should actually point out that there is and I, I've talked about this uh, a couple times before. There is a there is a project uh, ongoing right now at uh, the University of Groningen in the Netherlands called The Hands That Wrote the Bible. Um, in a nutshell, they're trying to track uh, they're they're trying to to set better precision on paleography by uh, using machine learning, artificial intelligence, and they've they've conducted a bunch of uh, new pe- uh, new carbon dating for a number of the the Dead Sea Scrolls. One of the manuscripts that they have dated is this um, this old copy of uh of daniel 11 and 12 um that you know has generally been dated to about 120 to 100, 140 120 bce uh the carbon dating on this one now suggests uh that it could be as old as like 170 like it's or 180 even 
Um, now, bear in mind, there's a 50 they, they give year. you a range, right? This yeah. is where the middle is. Mm-hmm. So, but it looks like it could be really, really old. And the leader of the project, I was just at a, a workshop in Helsinki and he was presenting and he threw this out there. He's starting to suggest, do we maybe have the very first autograph? Of any biblical text. That would be amazing. We don't know, right? But I would laugh though not, if they carbon dated it to like 250 BCE. Because then I would be like, oh. okay, <laughs> they're incorporating this literature oh, now. that predates yeah, yeah, yeah. when we would say this literature was written and they're just kind of bringing in these stories. You know what yeah, I mean? Like right. to make I would own. say praise Jesus. I probably <laughs> would too at that point. But uh but I mean it it it's wild. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it might be an autograph. The But the other thing I wanted to say about this, and, and that would be the most amazing thing, is the one book we can really nail down as Feld Prophecy has its autograph. Uh, like, we have an right? actual... Yeah. That'd be amazing. The other thing is, I thought of Enoch, right? So, we have this uh, weird yeah. character... <laughs> That goes way, way back into like, uh, you know, pre-flood times. He's he's this mysterious figure and all this literature comes spawning up yeah. and it's written. Enoch is written as if Enoch's writing this material and Enoch's the guy. Enoch is also written in Aramaic. And here's the question I have for the same people who pose this whole 40, 50 years later. Are we supposed to believe that the scribes who wrote that material um, were just like, completely making it up and then like pawning up. Oh, I felt maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. But like the communities didn't accept this. This could be a year ago that scribes wrote this and said, we found Enoch writing uh, and like, Oh wow. And they believe it. Who's to say that they didn't do that with Daniel or something. Cause it's like pretending that people in that Enochian, I'm going to call them Enochian community because they don't seem very mosaic. Uh, they don't, they have their own Torah kind of thing. Yeah. They right. take Enoch serious. Yeah. And did it take 40, 50, 60, 70 years for that literature to finally be taken serious after it was written? Uh, I just don't buy that. It's uh, it's mean, an I'm assumption. Trying to think of a place where somebody like went back into you know, the closet of the temple and said, hey, I, I found the book of the law. <laughs> oh, the book of the law. Huh. Yeah. That sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so... So Daniel's a, Daniel's an, a fascinating book. Um, it sure is. And it's just tying up loose ends here to make this point. This isn't Daniel related. This is just in our conversations because you're having to drive all the way back home, Kip. And 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 this has been a cherished time we get to spend together. And I hope we can do this in the future. Is that your the the more we learn the Dunning Kruger analogy you bring up with the whole narrow pathway and we're fifty feet away and then we're forty feet away and we're like but we not much has changed on yeah. our perception then we get in the door and you're like whoa yeah um I'd like to think on some things I might be peeking through the door on on other things I know I'm down the hall and that's yeah. cool because I depend on y'all who I know exactly. are way closer peeking in the door I have to depend on experts who know their stuff but I'll tell you this. Getting to that door, at first it may have looked and other people might have said, look, he's just anti this. He hates the material. He just wants to debunk it. I've actually grown to love it even more now. Oh, yeah. But from a secular position. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's, you, you, it's like falling in love with the Bible without the dogma. And you're yeah. like, okay, I can actually well, love this. Yeah. It, there's suddenly like 15 more questions, right? Yeah. To, to answer and, and and problems to explore and it's yeah I I think it's exciting it's 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 neat. I mean, you can love transformers and not have to worry about things like how did Optim- Optimus Prime actually engage those rockets on his back? Like, how did that happen? But some people really do worry about. That's it. true. It's, uh, uh, yeah, 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 because he really did activate those rockets on his back. <laughs> In case you were wondering. Um, thank you, guys. You have courses. You have YouTube channels. Uh, you have books. Lots of them. You're eventually, I guarantee you're going to put out more books. Uh, you already have yeah. one out, but it's not. I have. I mean, I, yeah, I have. I have. I have my my monograph is my my dissertation that was that was published. And I have a bunch more that I've edited, but they're all they're all super expensive. And yeah. Very. Yeah. So find those ones for free. They're out there. And subscribe to their channels. Check out the courses. Get the books. Kip, we're trying to grow your channel, man. We got to keep boosting those numbers. You know what I mean? So, 
Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.